Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. ESCOM has given insight into its plans for the repowering and repurposing of the Kamati power station as part of a larger Just Energy transition project and financing plan. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss the importance of this development. Hi Terence. Oh, In broad terms, what is ESCOM hoping to achieve with its Just Transition initiative? Well, I think it's really got two pillars. It's decarbonisation on the one end and social protection on the other. And Eskim has this asset base, which is old and is uh, in the process, some of it to be decommissioned. So we're going to have a number of power stations decommissioned over the next five years and over the next 20 years, just about the entire fleet other than Madupi and Kassilia, which are just coming into the system. So th really it's about using that uh, existing assets uh, the land around those assets, the water at those assets, as well as uh, the energy infrastructure around the assets to help Eskom transform into a, a company that's not as coal dominant as it currently is, and also to help those communities and workers that are, li that are uh, their livelihoods are around those power stations, whether they're coal miners or coal-fired power station workers or businesses that feed into those, uh, those power stations. Uh, to have some sort of alternative uh, uh, economic activity in those areas. Why is Kamati an important part of this plan and what initiatives are being mooted? Well, Kamati is a very old power station. It's been operating since 1961 so, and it's going to be decommissioned. It's actually it's almost decommissioned. I think there's only one remaining unit and that will be decommissioned next year. But it will be the pilot site for uh, Eskom's Just Energy Transition. Uh, activities and they've been doing quite a lot of community consultation in that area and they're looking at a number of options for that power station and uh, they really see this as the flagship uh, to show the world that they are able to um, to do this in a just way and they're looking at a number of uh, range of projects from using the workshops as a manufacturing factory to produce a containerized mi microgrid solution that will be used in South Africa, we, we have uh, the, uh, most of our population electrified at the moment, or households electrified. There's still about 13% unelectrified, and these are mostly in far-flung areas. And this containerized solution has been tested in the Free State over the last few years, has been shown to work, and they're going to look at, try to have a, a factory that will produce these containerized uh, microgrid solutions and then take these out into these far-flung areas. So that's the one option. And I imagine Eskom wouldn't be the main investor there, but it is its technology, but it would partner with the private sector. Then it's looking at a gas to power, uh, repowering at the station. So, um, so really taking the coal-fired power station and producing uh, electricity with gas, as well as uh, solar and battery energy storage options. So that's on the energy side. Then there are a number of uh, agricultural initiatives and agrivoltaic initiatives, which integrates um, solar and agriculture that are also being mooted. There's going to be a lot of water released because these power stations are heavily thirsty. Uh, really the, uh, the water that comes uh, is used in Kamati also is, is the potable water for the area. So it's it could, there's a number of uh, issues and projects uh, that are being uh, developed at the moment. How is ESCOM proposing to finance these projects? Well, I think that's going to be the trick. And uh, ESCOM is potentially in a sweet spot here. It's done a lot of work behind the scenes over the last year on what that was initially called a just energy transition transaction. But it really has now progressed this uh, uh, um, idea into what they would try and have a, a facility, so to have a multi-trance, a multi-year, a multi-project facility uh, that uh, international lenders that are try uh, that are keen on decarbonisation projects and on just energy transition projects, you know, it's part of the uh, Paris Agreement, where uh, tr energy transition in the developing countries needs to be financed partly by developed world uh, finance, as well as that it must be a, a just transition. So there must be social upliftment or social protection as we do that. So about a hundred billion dollars a year is pledged. Uh, there's some concern that this money isn't flowing at the rate it should be because we should start seeing that money in the system between 2022 and 2025, 100 billion dollars a year. And then uh, South Africa is wanting that massively upscaled 
as the uh, decade uh, advances because this is going to be the key decarbonization decade. If we don't do the decarbonization now as the world, we're not going to meet the 1.5 degree threshold that uh, the, the Glasgow uh, COP26 summit is going to be all about, keeping on that pathway, keeping that window of opportunity alive. So Eskim has got this, uh, this uh, model, this f facility. They're wanting to market it. They're wanting government to market it at the COP26 to international lenders. They've already had a number of engagements with uh, lenders from the World Bank, European Union lenders, um, uh, lenders from the US, and there seems to be quite a lot of uh, uh, appetite for it and excitement. I think the World Bank's comment was that this is the most advanced just energy transition transaction that they've actually come across in the world. But obviously many other countries are going to be doing the same and going to be wanting to use uh, COP26 uh, to market themselves as good places for decarbonization and just transition projects. What are the main risks to this initiative? I think the main risk is that South Africa doesn't get its uh, ducks in a row ahead of COP26. So we can still see that there's different strands of thought about our energy transition, about the pace and scale of decarbonization. Uh, Eskom's brought in, it is a, uh, this is an ex existential threat to Eskom. They know they have to change. They're going to be splitting uh, the utility into three divisions. The generation division, which is coal dominant, needs to find a way to start uh, integrating renewable energy. Raising this sort of finance would be important for that. Obviously, uh, the, the world has changed and Eskom will no longer be the only game in town when it comes to electricity generation. And there are a lot of other um, uh, renewables and non-renewables capacity that will be coming in that won't be Eskom related. But Eskom has this eight gigawatts of potential uh, renewables, battery energy storage, gas uh, available in this package and they would like this to be marketed. And I think the risk is that, that we don't have a whole of government and a whole of society approach. And the key here is going to be the Presidential Climate Commission to knock heads together, to get our uh, framework very much in place so that we're all singing off the same hymn sheet when the President arrives uh, in Glasgow later this year so that we can make put our best fo foot forward and make the case for South Africa being the best place in the world just about to de do decarbonisation and the cheapest. I think Eskom's uh, estimates is that it uh, costs $7 a tonne to reduce carbon dioxide in South Africa versus over 120 in the European Union at the moment. So we really are in a sweet spot. There's the, there's the potentially with the finance. Uh, the, all the planets are aligning in terms of the urgency around um, needing to do both uh, decarbonisation and social protection projects. It's now about getting our, uh, our message uh, in an ordered, ordered way so that we can communicate this to COP, so that we can start, especially next year, uh, showing the world what we can do at Kamati. Thank you. That's the second Take Show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily Email Newsletter.